It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. What some are calling the largest animal disease outbreak in history is currently ravaging pig farms in China and in other Asian countries. The disease is known as African swine fever and has a similar effect on hogs as Ebola has on humans, causing massive internal hemorrhaging and a very high death rate. So far, over one million hogs in China have been culled, slaughtered that is, to stop the spread of the disease. However, China has over 440 million hogs in total, half of the world's hog population, and experts estimate that up to 200 million hogs will have to be killed this year alone to slow down the spread of the disease. African swine fever does not affect humans, but it is bound to have a devastating effect on food security in Asia, which depends on pork for much of its meat consumption. In Vietnam, for example, 75% of meat consumption is pork. Already, pork prices have risen by as much as 40% globally. The disease has been spreading slowly since the 2000s in Europe and now in Asia, where it has turned into an ep epidemic. Joining me now to discuss the causes, consequences, and solutions to African swine fever is Rob Wallace. Rob is a public health phylogeographer at the Agroecology Ecology and Rural Economics Research Corps in Minnesota. He is the author of Big Farms Make Big Flu. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Uh, hello. It's, uh, I would say it's a pleasure to be here, but I think my real news uh, audience sees me. They know that some terrible disease has happened out there somewhere. Right. So one of the big problems in containing the African swine fever is that it is dormant for up to two weeks and that a tiny amount of the virus can cause infection. In other words, it's extremely contagious. As I mentioned, it does not affect, infect humans. But um, what are the dangers for humans of this outbreak? Well, I mean, you did uh, touch on the economic uh, issue, but uh, I would actually uh, roll that back in terms of what the dangers might be for humans. Uh, currently, there, aren't any, there isn't any evidence that humans are uh, adversely infected or, or become sick. Um, but I assure you that uh, thousands of uh, farmers and uh, uh, meat processors and cleanup crews are being uh, uh, exposed to the virus, and some of them are probably even uh, 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 undergoing active infection, although they're not getting sick. Uh, the danger, of course, is uh, despite, uh, uh, without being an alarmist about it, uh, the, despite the fact that presently humans aren't being affected, there's always a uh, possibility that uh, uh, pathogens can evolve, and uh, you know an active uh, infection can go uh, virulent, and uh, we then have the possibility that a strain might uh, evolve uh, the capacity to go human to human. Uh, so, uh, on a biological level, on the virology level, on the epidemiological level, uh, presently humans are not uh, uh, at danger, but. Uh, um, I would uh, not take that as a, a given. Uh, as far as the economics go, of course, uh, you know, you, your number, uh, the numbers you quoted, uh, you know, in terms of how many uh, hog are being killed, uh, you know, has a, a tremendous uh, impact on the uh, farmers in terms of their production. Um, and of course, uh, uh, one of the dangers of all this is that uh, uh, industrial pr uh, producers are, uh, like to point their fingers on, on smallholders and backyard producers as being the cause uh, because of they are not engaging the, uh, the biosecurity necessary uh, to keep the uh, African swine fever uh, virus from spreading. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, at, at present, uh, it's the industrial production, in my, in my view, that's uh, really just uh, driving uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, its capacity to uh, uh, hide out uh, and, um, and its uh, infectiousness uh, makes it a, uh, an issue when you pack in uh, hundreds of hog in a, in a, in a barn. Uh, and it makes it, uh, in fact, some of the, the strains uh, can actually uh, uh, hang out in, uh, in uh, cured meat for, uh, for uh, 300 days and, and in frozen uh, carcasses for as long as 15 years. So this isn't something that we can, uh, that we're going to be able to just wait out. So you started talking about what some of the causes are. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. I mean, you mentioned uh, the industrial farming. Exactly how is it, what's the connection between industrial farming and the outbreak like this? Sure, well, we should take a step back because uh, uh, most pathogens don't uh, emerge as uh, immediately industrial production. They have the uh, humble beginnings, as it were. Uh, an African swine fever, uh, uh, began uh, as, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, as a wild pathogen that uh, uh, transmitted between uh, 
um, uh, warthog and, um, and uh, local uh, soft ticks. Um, and then uh, as far as the um, scientific literature shows, about the 1920s, it began to spill over into uh, uh, local hog, uh, uh, domestic hog production. Um, in the 1950s, it's, uh, it got its way up into the Iberian Peninsula and, uh, in uh, Portugal and Spain, uh, where it uh, circulated for about 30 years before it uh, was um, uh, uh, quashed. Uh, it, was in 19, it was in 2007, however, that um, uh, the virus uh, emerged uh, in a way uh, and exploded across the uh, Eastern Europe and the uh, former Soviet republics. Um, and then uh, by uh, 2018, it, uh, it, it popped over into China. Um, but it, it's the, the important thing to understand is that uh, pathogens uh, go through these, uh, these uh, changes in, um, in terms of their success uh, in relationship to um, um, the opportunities that they're provided. So, uh, you know, when you have an industrial production of hog that are pretty much genetically the same genetic monocultures, you, uh, you know, mash them all in together in, uh, in the thousands, um, not only in particular barns, but uh, across uh, whole regions, uh, that predicts, permits uh, pathogens that are uh, virulent, that are very deadly, and would normally just burn out because they, they kill their host too fast and they can't get into the next host. Well, if they can get into a barn that has hundreds of, uh, of hog that way, they can burn right through and continue to reproduce and transmit uh, from barn to barn. So uh, industrial production uh, is, uh, uh, has been shown to be very good in terms of uh, hosting uh, virulent strains of pathogens, uh, not only African swine fever, but uh, swine influenza and other uh, uh, viruses and bacteria. Now, as you mentioned, also previous outbreaks of African swine fever, as particularly in Spain and Portugal, which began in the 1950s and 60s, uh, took over 30 years to, to get under control. And uh, some experts that I've read uh, said that uh, they, it was handled by increasing biosecurity through the creation of large hog farms and using antibiotics and careful monitoring. Now, some are saying that this is the strategy that China ought to deploy. Now, clearly that would contradict or that would not be exactly the recommendation I would see from what you've been saying so far. So yeah. what would you say would be the solution uh, or how one ought to deal with this problem? Well, you know, the problem uh, is in that in, in agriculture, um, uh, it's the, so focused on uh, the social reproduction of capital rather than uh, the uh, production of food. That's kind of the uh, offshoot of all, all this. And so there's a lot of focus on protecting the uh, economic model uh, at uh, any cost, including blaming uh, um, uh, parties that have nothing to do with uh, or very little to do with the actual emergence and, and global spread of, uh, of this pathogen. I mean, uh, uh, smallholder farmers don't have the, the capacity to export their hog from country to country. And uh, since the 1960s, you've had an explosion in, uh, in terms of the exports of hog from country to country and the number of hogs that are produced. Um, and so this goes arm in arm or hoof uh, and hoof uh, with the emergence of um, uh, multiple new strains of deadly diseases. So if you're actually interested in controlling this, you basically have to change your, your model of food production in such a way that you don't offer the opportunity of, uh, for these pathogens to uh, be selected for and to spread. So um, I would basically say you have to end uh, agribusiness as we know it. Uh, at this point, uh, any disease or outbreak that happens, they just externalize the cost into everybody else. So governments, consumers, uh, smallholders, uh, the, the, uh, the livestock themselves, local environments uh, always end up paying the costs in terms of these outbreaks uh, in such a way that allows the actual source of, uh, of the deadly diseases to continue to be, uh, continue to uh, continue on as a, uh, a mode of production. So in essence, stop producing so many hog, uh, devolve back into uh, smallholders who produce most of the, the world's food as it is, um, genetically diversify your, your, uh, your hog breeds in such a way that uh, when you do have an outbreak, uh, it can't spread so easily from place to place. And uh, also you should allow your hog to reproduce on site so that there are hogs that do survive, they can pass on their immunity to the next generation. And that's completely contrary to the present industrial model in which uh, uh, if a hog does survive, it can't produce. Uh, all the breeding is done offshore at the grandparent level. 
So uh, for morphological characteristics, not so much for uh, disease control. And so uh, if you want to select a, a, a mode of production that produces the worst disease possible, and uh, that would be the present industrial model. Mm. Okay, well, we're going to leave it there for now. I'm speaking to Rob Wallace of the Agroecology and Rural Economics Research Corps. Thanks again, Rob, for having joined us today. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.